Uh, great to see everyone. And today we are going to talk about hospice care. And also, later in the program, we have the Threshold Singers, and they will uh, discuss what they do um, working with our hospice care. And without further ado, we have Kristen, Grit, I can mean, never say her name Chris. Kristen Chris, who also comes, usually we see her like quarterly and talking about deciding together and some other programs, as well as Dr. David DeSantis. So, uh, without further ado, I'm turning this over to them. Hi everybody, I'm Kristen. Um, again, we're here to talk about introduction to hospice care. Um, so, if there's any questions that are throughout this, please feel free to raise your hand. We can definitely get to those questions and get those answered. Um, but what is hospice? So hospice is a program that helps um, support those in their last phase of an incurable disease. So we're here to help make sure that someone stays comfortable during that time and that we're looking at um, the quality of the remaining life versus the quantity. Um, we're usually looking at no more doctor's visits because we're coming to the house and we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, and we're looking at no more dialysis treatment, so no aggressive um, curative treatments that is what we're looking at right now. Um, what do you have to add to that? Well, I, I think the biggest thing that we can uh, try to get out when we're talking about hospice care and how it applies to folks is that really it's a quality of life issue. So many people, think of hospice and they think you sign up for hospice, you get a whole bunch of morphine and then you die. And that, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Hospice really is really good home care for somebody that we can't fix. And if we change the paradigm, para, paradigm a little bit so that we look at it in a little bit different way, it allows folks that we can't cure to be able to stay where they want to be and be cared for by the people they want to care for them at a time where they really need that support. And the, the biggest goal that we have, like Kristen said, this is a quality of life issue. We know we're not gonna be able to cure whatever the problem is, whether it's heart failure or pulmonary fibrosis or cancer or kidney disease or whatever other the ultimate medical problem is that's causing someone not to be able to recover, we want to make sure that they are treated very well during that time. And it's very, it's very hard to take care of somebody who's, who's terminally ill uh, or even chronically ill and not terminal. And the caregiver burden is just incredible. And you know, I look around the room and I know a lot of you have experienced that already. You've been caregivers for somebody who is not going to be able to recover and the amount of, of effort that is required is just just incredible what we do is that we allow you to be able to take care of your loved one because we're providing support I'm going to have Kristen talk a little bit about the nursing support that is available through hospice and then I can talk more about the logistics the medical problems we re I really want to emphasize the importance of quality of life this really is about quality. This is about making sure that folks have what they need when they need it and having the support available so that we can help you take care of those in your family that truly need that, our help. I'll have Kristen talk a little bit about the logistics of the nursing care that's given, the nursing aids, the support services and things along those lines. And then after that, then she'll hand it back to me to talk more about the medical side of it, what I do, what my uh, case management nurses do, medication management, and things along those lines. So with hospice, you have a team approach when you have care. So like he was talking about, so Dr. DeSantis is our medical director of hospice services, and he's gonna oversee the care of the, um, the person that's in hospice services. He's gonna oversee all the care just, and make sure that they are getting the uh, support, the medications that they are needing to make sure they do have that comfort. Um, he also was going to be able to recertify you if 
Um, Medicare sees hospice as you have a, a six month or less life expectancy, but that doesn't mean that at six months that you get kicked out of the hospice program. That's where he comes in and he does the reevaluation just to make sure that you're still meeting that criteria, the qualifications to be in hospice services, and then um, if you still want to continue to have hospice services, that's where he would come in at that point in time. Um, if on admission we talk with you about the your attending provider, um, he is always willing, Dr. DeSantis is always willing to be your attending physician as well while in hospice services, but um, we do have the option to talk with your provider and see if they're willing to follow uh, while in hospice services as well. We have nursing support, so like he said, there's a nurse that will come out to the home um, with read standards at least once a week to see you. Um, we can adjust those visits as needed. So if you're needing a little bit more assistance in the home, just a little bit more direction, uh, uh, we definitely can come more often than that one time a week. Uh, Medicare says it's once in, in a two week period, but read is required once in a, every week you get an RN visit. Um, those visits are usually about an hour long when they come out and do, the, do their visits, and they're looking at what symptoms are going on at that point in time. And, and at that point, that's when they, if there's something new that's happening, if um, symptoms are kind of getting worse and you're not feeling comfortable, maybe you're feeling more short of breath, you're having a lot more pain, um, something new that's com that comes up, then we reach out to Dr. DeSantis and see what we can do to help get you back comfortable. Um, with that, we also, we're available to come to your house 24 seven. So we always tell people we're your new 911. So in the middle of the night, you have a crisis situation. You normally would call 911 and go to the emergency room. You're gonna call us and we are going to be able to come to your house if that's something that is necessary at that point in time. We can uh, come out and see what the situation is and then give guidance at that point in time. Um, we have home health aides that are available as well. So their home health aides come out. They are anywhere as often as you would like. So either one to zero, or excuse me, one to five times a week. You don't have to have any as well. And they can always be added on if needed. So maybe you start the program, you don't feel like you're needing the hospice, um, a home health aide to come in, but just know that that can always be added on later. But they do bath visits, they can do light housekeeping as well, and again, their visits are about an hour long too. We have medical social workers, and they are fantastic. They help with um, aid and funeral planning, so if that's something that you would need help direction with. Um, they help with community assistance and emotional support. They're also just a big ball of information, so if we don't know where to go, we turn to them. Um, we also have our chaplain services as well, and we actually have one of our chaplains here. Dave is back there, um, and they are so amazing. They, um, they're non-denominational. They're there for spiritual and emotional support, too. They help with bereavement support. They're, again, another ball of information. If we don't know where to go, we turn to them. Um, we have volunteer services, so they are companionship, um, and we also have pet therapy, and then we do reach out to the Threshold Choir as well to help with that assistance, and you'll hear about their wonderful program after a bit. But with that, um, the reason why I say it's companionship is just because the, the volunteers are hands-off. They can help and sit, read, um, Maybe if there's someone that's available to do haircuts, there's someone that can come and do that as well. There's just different things that they have for uh, volunteer services. And then additional services that we provide. So with um, Medicare, it covers at hospice at 100% as long as it is related to the terminal diagnosis and uh, any of the related um, supporting diagnosis for the, uh, the payment. Payment, yeah, for payment of everything. So the medications that we do, the supplies that we pr provide, equipment that's needed, and the bereavement support is all covered um, under hospice at 100% with that. Do you want to add some more to that? Sure, I appreciate that. Um, we, we will pro we're responsible for pretty much all of the care that's related to the hospice um, diagnosis, but generally the care of the patient. Um, I'll go a little bit about uh, the the uh, medical director's role versus the uh, family physician's role. Medicare does allow for the family physician to be paid while the patient is under hospice care. Now, Medicare typically does not pay specialists. So if, uh, if a person is being seen for their, for their end-stage lung disease and they want to see their pulmonologist, 
it's not going to be paid for. And so that's, that's a situation where you could be seen by either medical director of the hospice or, the, or your family doctor and be treated for that exacerbation or, or bronchitis or whatever it is, but they're not going to pay the specialist for that. And so that, that typically does not negatively impact your ability to get care. It's just going to change how it's done, who's going to do it, and oftentimes what the cost of that care would be. Um, we are responsible for payment of all of the costs of the care. So sometimes, you know, going on from the medical side, I will not continue every medication that somebody is on in an outpatient setting. But that being said, nobody feels good if they have a rip-roaring bladder infection. So if somebody's got symptoms, I can either do a urinalysis or I can treat based on what the symptoms are. And I very typically will use antibiotics that can be given by mouth because it's a lot more humane to treat somebody for something simple rather than let it get beyond our abilities and have folks suffer unnecessarily. And you know, I, I know in hospice everybody's expected to die, but that doesn't mean it has to be today. And so there are things that, that I will typically act on where some other, uh, some other hospice agencies or medical directors may see things otherwise and not, and not be that aggressive. On the other side of it, if we've got somebody that truly is terminal and what we're dealing with is you know, terminal agitation or the actual dying process, then our goal is going to be comfort. It's not going to be rushing to the hospital, put them in the ICU. Uh, those, those days have gone. So we're going to treat people differently, kind of depending on what stage they're in and what their level of need is. Um, I typically will stop statin medications. Oftentimes I'll stop blood thinners. But I'll keep them on water pills, I'll keep them on blood pressure medications, um, stomach medications, plus or minus, depending on need. So I'm not going to stop everything because folks aren't comfortable if they can't breathe. I do the same thing with, uh, with pulmonary medications. Oftentimes I'll go to something that's a little easier to deliver or less expensive, but that doesn't mean that care is going to be a whole lot um, different or negatively impacted because the stuff that they're using today was only replace something that was just fine five years ago and is a whole lot cheaper. So a lot of times we'll go back a few years and use medications that are a little less expensive but still effective. And then sometimes we'll decrease pill burden by maybe switching to a blood pressure medicine that's once a day instead of one that's two or three times a day. Or maybe we will uh, just limit the numbers of medications that folks take and maybe get rid of some vitamins. I typically don't don't keep calcium and vitamin D on board. You know, those are things, if you want to take them, you're fine. But it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that that's really helpful to keep you from getting into trouble 10 years from now. But if your life expectancy is only months rather than years, then there's not a whole lot of value taking that kind of medicine. So uh, realize that this truly is outpatient medicine. Um, I'm a family doctor by training. Um, I've taken care of lots of you guys and some of your family members over the years. So, you know, I, I think like a family doctor still. And that means that, you know, we treat you as a person for what you have wrong with you. And we try to support you in every way that we can so that you can stay functional in your home. And that's, that's really what our primary goal is. Unfortunately, sometimes folks can't stay in their homes. Um, safety has got to be our number one, okay? Safety first, then comfort second. Uh, because if somebody is not safe in the home, bad things are going to happen. So we really have to keep that in mind. So please be aware of that. So not everybody is going to be where they want to be as long as they want to be, just because it's not practical. Um, if it's not practical to stay at home, there are a few other options. You know, one is folks can uh, stay with a family member or family member can stay with the patient. Or there's outside agencies that can provide support. We oftentimes will work with the supporting services that are in the back of the room um, with what they have available. And sometimes, depending on who the payer is, there may be hours through live stream or there may be other support that's available. So we want to coordinate with those other agencies as best as we can to provide the services that are needed. And our social workers are very good at that and they reach out to the other agencies and, uh, and we try to, 
to take advantage of the care that's available in the community as much as possible. Again, for the goal of keeping those folks at home. If it's not possible to stay at home, uh, we do have options for placement in, in another venue, maybe a nursing home. Difficulty with nursing homes is that it's expensive. And if it's Medicare alone, then hospice is paid by Medicare hospice, but the nursing home is not. So there's a pretty significant per diem or daily charge for folks that are on hospice but in a nursing home. So we want to, we want to try to avoid that if possible, not because we're against it, it's just because it's too expensive. Now, if somebody already qualifies for Medicaid, then, and they already have Medicaid in place, then you can do hospice in a nursing home because Medicare pays us, Medicaid pays the nursing home, and the patients can then be where they have to be and get those services without an just outrageous cost, okay? So that is available, but it's not available for everybody depending on what insurance uh, the folks have and what, uh, what benefits they have. Okay. Uh, we do have inpatient hospice, and in, an inpatient hospice I limit to folks that really are in a terminal situation. They don't have very much time left or they just have symptoms that we can't control. Now, we utilize our inpatient hospice fairly aggressively, and that is because so many of the folks that I get on consultation are already in the hospital, have very serious illness, and aren't, out, and aren't going to be able to go home because they're that sick. Um, our inpatient hospice, I tend to like to limit to less than two weeks duration, um, and if it's going to be longer than that, if somebody is aggressively declining, well, obviously, I'm going to keep them there because I have to manage them. But if they're stable, then we really need to have them at, at some place else where they can be cared for, whether that's at home, whether it's a nursing home, whether it's assisted living, or whether it's other people that come in and, and help out with the caregiving. So inpatient is available. Sometimes I'll take somebody who's in the outpatient setting and all of a sudden has an abrupt decompensation in their, their health and they require more aggressive care, I can bring them into the inpatient unit, get them medically stabilized if possible, discharge them back to home, or if not, then I keep them inpatient and take care of them until they pass in the inpatient unit. Uh, the things that are different between inpatient and outpatient, outpatient, we're gonna use medications by pill, by patch, or liquid. In the inpatient unit, we're typically going to have availability of IV medications. So somebody that's sicker and is going to require more aggressive care, I've got the ability to take care of them in that way there. I, I, I don't typically have that ability at, at home. Um, and IV medications are problematic for lots of different reasons. And so we, we try to limit those to the inpatient setting. Um, but we do, have, we do have plenty of comfort medications available for home patients at, at Good doses, too. So we, we can adjust based on what folks' needs are. Safe doses, too. Pardon? Safe doses. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> that was a good point. I, I, uh, Kristen just said safe doses. Now, one of the things that we um, think about with the hospice medications, and they are comfort medications, is, as I alluded to earlier, hospice, morphine, death. Everybody knows about morphine. Everybody's heard about morphine. Everybody has their own experiences with family members or friends or somebody in the community that they know that has been on morphine at one time or another. Now, morphine is a dangerous medication. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the morphine that we are using is pharmaceutical grade morphine. The quantities are known. The prescriptions are very well managed and monitored. It's not a medication that we're going to just willy-nilly use. So even though it is a medication that has potential risk, we're using it in such a way to limit those risks to the best of our ability. It doesn't mean it couldn't be used inappropriately or accidentally overdosed or any of that stuff, but it is a medication we take very seriously. Same with fentanyl, same with oxycodone, same with Ativan and Valium and, and Xanax, all those medications, medications we commonly use, but we are using them for a particular reason, for comfort. And we know 
how to use them, we know when to use them, we know why to use them, and we're conscientious about how we do that. Okay? Yes, there are risks. Understand, this is a different population than all of you who are out living your lives, taking care of business, and you can't be doped up all the time, and you can't be driving cars, and you can't be using machinery, and you can't be buying and selling stocks when you're all loaded up on these medicines. I get that. But understand, we're taking care of a very specific population that has different needs and different goals. Because of that, we're, we, have to, we have to use different medications in different ways. Okay? I just kind of lost my train oh, of thought. Kristen, reorient me, please. No, you're fine. I was just going to also add, with, uh, with the medication standpoint of things, um, with hospice, yes, we do have that morphine out in the home, and we educate the families <laughs> on the symptoms to look for, how much, how often to give that medication. And just something that I want to um, put out there, too, is just that um, Especially, it just, it's going to be situational on how much and how often that person's going to get that medication. Um, we have a, like a standard that we might tell you at the beginning, this is what we're looking at. But if they're having uh, some severe pain or severe shortness of breath or difficulty with their breathing, you know, we may be looking at a different dose and a different um, how often it's given. So just know that if you happen to have talked to somebody about um, their loved one that had been in hospice services, then you've talked with somebody else and they may be different when it comes to that. Uh, that's one thing that we do is we alter the plan of care for that individual and for that family. So not everybody's going to be exactly the same. So just know that that's another thing to, with that safe medication. Uh, we're also just monitoring those symptoms and seeing that this medication is safe, the dosing amount that we're giving you is safe. Um, so that's just a big thing that I always like to put out too, um, just because everybody is that has that stigma of uh, morphine when we're talking about that. So um, yeah, let, me, let me add on okay, that. Yeah. Um, going, on, going on the medications and on what Kristen said, we, we do have medications in the home. Um, we are very conscientious about that. We provide lock boxes for homes that aren't safe. Uh, we alter our delivery of medications so that depending on what the situation is, we're not gonna have a whole bunch of medication around that's gonna put somebody at risk of diversion or of somebody else taking their medicine and it not being available. Uh, we, we pay attention to those kinds of things. Like Kristen said, oftentimes we will have to make adjustments on the fly, and if we do that, that's what our on-call nurses are for. The advantage of having the medications in the home before you need them is that if 2 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, somebody wakes up short of breath or in new pain that they haven't had before, there are a few doses of the medications that we're likely to need at the home already. We call that our comfort kit, and it, it has a little bit of Ativan, sleeping aids, uh, nausea medication, um, some morphine liquid. So we've got a little bit of, of what we're likely to run into so that we can give you instructions. Go ahead and give this particular medication and see how it works. We'll either have you call back or if we need to go out and do a visit that night, we will. One of the biggest advantages of the on-call is that there's somebody there to answer your questions in real time. We've got a nurse on call all the time. If we get a call, if, if our nurse doesn't answer the phone, it's because she's probably talking to another family. Leave a message and she'll get, get back with you quickly. Um, if you don't hear, call back because that nurse is supposed to be answering the phone. And typically the only reason that I've heard of that my nurses aren't answering the phone is because they're in the middle of some other care that they couldn't get it. Uh, and so they're busy and they just haven't gotten a chance to call back yet. And then, of course, occasionally you get that message and then you get distracted again and forget to make the call. So if you don't hear, we, we want to hear back from you. But they are there to answer the questions. And a lot of times what you all need is permission to do what you know you should be doing. Or, or which of these two medicines am I supposed to be given for what reason? And we can answer those questions quickly. Most of the calls that we get at night don't result in a, as an, in a nurse going out to the home because... The family didn't need them to once they talked to them. So, you know, that, that's a huge advantage. And that's, that's a big advantage when I say we're really good home care. That's an advantage over home care is that you don't get that service overnight. 
Uh, Kristen said, we're your 911. That's because we take care of 95% of what you're going to need without having to go out and search for that care. Uh, you've got to dedicate a case manager or nurse that knows the patients, knows what to expect. Every two weeks, we have an interdisciplinary team meeting. We go over every single patient that we have, what's going on with them, what medications they're on. I'm actively engaged in that meeting, and we're going to review medications. We're going to review care plan. We're going to talk about what their service needs are, whether or not we have to change their home care, whether there are any special needs that they have. All of that stuff is discussed every time we have a care plan meeting. So we know our people and we, and we adjust our care plan based on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted just to hit on about with the other services that we provide. So within hospice, and like Dr. Sands had discussed earlier about how being a caregiver can be pretty stressful at times, uh, we do have respite care that's available within hospice services. So that's where someone, where the, where the patient at the time would be able to come to the hospital and stay for five days out of every 30 days. So that would give the, that caregiver some relief. So if you um, just, just kind of were at your wit's end and you just needed a break. And if there was, um, you had multiple doctor's appointments, you unfortunately got sick yourself. Um, if you had a, a, a a wedding that was out of town we've had before that's where someone could come in for respite care and be, be able to stay in the hospital for those five days out of that calendar that 30 day calendar month um, again you know that's something that if we're able to get that pre kind of um, planned out to have that person come in that's even better um, but just know that we understand that caregiving can be very stressful so it's just an option to look at and to see and have available talk about travel Oh yes, with um, within hospice too, you're not confined to your home. So with that, if the if the patient is able and wants to go on, um, you know, a trip to Florida, maybe not right now, but um, <laughs> or you know wants to go wants to get out and go travel and see family elsewhere, um, they are allowed to do. We are able to do travel contracts, so we get in contact with another hospice agency that's in that community that they'll be staying in. Um, you know, obviously we'd probably want you the caregiver to go with them as well and then you know that way they can stay there for um, 13 days because on that 14th day we would need to be able to do another reassessment on them um, to make sure that they can stay in our services but you still get some time away from the home so you're not bound to the home at that point in time so if you are feeling well enough to go on that vacation you can absolutely do that um, so that's what definitely um, something so thanks for reminding me about that that we don't talk about often but uh, you know just know that you're not confined to your home and folks can leave town without having to arrange for a travel contract it's just duration limited mm -hmm. so if you're going to go overnight we really ought to know about that so we can make arrangements with the hospice in that community so that then we can prepare if something goes wrong we've had folks that you know go to indianapolis to shop or they want to go to muncie or they want to go to, to wherever they go, but, and they, no problems, they go, they come back, they're still under our care, we're still responsible for them, um, but that, that is kind of the way it's set up. If somebody is going to go and stay for an extended period of time, it's not our rules about the 14 days, that's mm -hmm. Medicare. If you're outside of our service area for a greater, greater than, or two weeks or more, we, are obligated to transfer your care or discontinue your care. Uh, cases like that, it would be a matter of making arrangements with the hospice in that area so that they could pick up your care from where, where we were. And that perfectly legitimate and can be done. Um, in that regard, I just wanna say, you know, we're from Reed, we're from Reed Hospice. We are not the only hospice in this community. And every other hospice in this community is an excellent hospice. So even though I want you all to use our services, I'll tell you right out, right out flat, I want your caregivers to have hospice care when it's appropriate. Whether it's me delivering it or whether it's one of the other agencies, totally fine as long as that loved one gets the care they need. They're Services are a little bit different. Some of them will allow for services that we don't. Like, I don't take care of 
dialysis patients in our hospice. Logistically, for me, it's just too difficult. I'm just not able to do a good job with it. So I say, if you're going to continue on dialysis, you're probably not ready for my service, even though you qualify for it. That being said, other hospices are okay with dialysis and they can take you and, and that would be fine. I have no objection to it. This is a thing for me. I'm not good at it and I don't want to, I don't want to offer you services that I can't do a good job at. So that's where it is. Some things are just too expensive. Um, we've seen a lot of folks that are on Trilogy, which is a non-invasive ventilator. It's horribly expensive and we don't have any at Reed. Um, BiPAP is 95% is good and we've got them. So I can send somebody home on BiPAP at night rather than the Trilogy ventilator. I've, I've got the equipment that I can deliver. I don't have to lease it from somebody else at more than we would get paid for to take care of all of your care and the, the care doesn't suffer terribly. Other agencies have different ways that they manage it. Maybe they're, they're, they're um, their sponsoring organization has them or however they work it, they're able to do that. So there are things that we don't do. Other, other hospices may be able to do a better job. Um, on the respite, we utilize the hospital because we have a hospital. The other hospices don't have hospitals. So they typically will set up their respite care somewhere else, whether that's with a nursing home or an assisted living, or whether they have some other arrangement where they make their respite work. But all of them are excellent, and I, I want to emphasize that. If hospice is appropriate, hospice is appropriate. If you choose us, thank you. If you choose another one, then I fully support that decision because ultimately the care is what this is all about. Go ahead. So you said if appropriate, who makes that initial consultation or request? Excellent question. Um, the, the criteria, like Kristen stated already, or we have to have someone who has a terminal condition. They have to have a lifespan of less than six months if the disease progresses as it's, at its normal course, and they have to not be seeking aggressive care for that condition. So that's how we make that decision. It does not have to be the hospice that makes that decision. It can be your family doctor or your cardiologist or your nephrologist or your oncologist. A physician or nurse practitioner makes the determination that this patient has a terminal condition, they are not actively seeking treatment for it, and the life expectancy, if the disease progresses as expected, is six months or less. And then as Kristen stated earlier, patient has to be agreeable with this. If the patient doesn't agree with it, I can't force them into a program that they don't agree with. I can recommend it, I can offer it, I can do a song and dance, I can do all kinds of things to try and get them to go along with it, but ultimately they have to be the ones that are willing to accept our care. And once that happens, then we can proceed on from there. But yeah, it's, it's typically it's a doctor or nurse practitioner that makes that determination. And then, as Kristen stated earlier, if folks get to that six month mark, now I as the medical director am responsible for making the determination whether they're still eligible. Do they still have end stage lung disease? Do they still have cancer that's not being treated? Do they have advanced heart failure? Do they have end stage dementia? Do they have some other condition that makes it so they still have a life expectancy that's months or less? And then do they still want to stay on the program? If those conditions are met, I can recertify and then we certify for two months at a time. Okay. Initially it's 90 days and then a nurse recertifies, then another 90 days comes to the six month mark. I recertify after that, it's every 60 days after that. And there's no limit to the number of times that we can recertify. But again, those conditions still have to be in place. They have to have a terminal condition, not being treated, life expectancy months or less, and patient has to be willing to continue on the program. Okay. Other questions? I'll add on to that too, is we definitely want that referral to come from the, your provider, if at all possible, 
but um, I always say to be your own advocate and if you feel that there is a need or you want some additional information about a service, we, our service, our Reed Hospice is more than happy to take self-referrals. So if you were to call in and just give us information, we definitely will look at that information. We'll run it by Dr. DeSantis as well. And then we can always come out, do an evaluation and talk about our services at that point in time. Um, again, okay. There is no Medicare requirement that a doctor or nurse me practitioner has to make the referral. They just have to meet the criteria. So self-referrals are absolutely welcome, um, but it is just part of the process. The evaluation has to be done to see whether or not that patient is appropriate. Sorry. No, you're fine. Perfect. Um, if it's okay, I will move to, I, we talk, keep talking about Medicare a lot, but who pays for hospice services? So of course we're gonna be talking about Medicare because that's our biggest payer for that. But um, as Dr. DeSantis mentioned earlier, it, Medicaid as well can help with services as well. And when I'm talking about Medicaid, I'm, I think of traditional or full Medicaid is what we're talking about there. Um, so if that's all that that person was to have was just that full Medicaid, it would help pay for hospice the services as well, as well as if they were to need to go into a nursing facility to, um, for that additional care if, if it came down to that. Now, private paid insurances, they also usually have a clause in there about hospice services, government, VA, TRICARE. We do self-pay as well, so if you didn't have any payer source, but just know that regardless of who your payer source is, we still will come out and talk with you. If you still want hospice services, we definitely want to be able to give you that, those services at that time. Well, um, yes, we do accept self-pay, but typically folks that are self-pay will maybe start that way, but our social workers are gonna be very active in trying to find out what benefits are available and get folks into those programs. Kristen mentioned the traditional Medicaid versus the other Medicaid option plans. There's a lot of replacement plans, Medicare and Medicaid. Those are variable in what they'll pay for. Almost every insurance, whatever kind it is, understands that hospice care ends up costing them less than traditional care because we're not doing so many tests, we're not doing so many medications, we're not seeing so many different doctors and so that overall will end up costing the insurance company less, even if we have folks for much longer than the six months, because if they were gonna live that long anyway, then chances are they'd have had a lot more CAT scans and MRIs and, and knee scopes and eye injections, so, okay. That's right, that's another thing too. Another I, question oh, sorry. in the back, yes. Kristen. Say you have a veteran who is needing hospice and he has his VA benefits, but he wants to use Reed Hospice Care. Is there a problem with switching the benefits as far as the VA insurance paying for? So what we would do is we would talk with the we would talk with the VA and see. Usually we ask those questions about the Medicare questionnaires that you probably get all at your doctor's offices, and then we see that if. Um, if you want to use your Medicare services or if you want to use the VA benefits, and then at that point in time, we contact the VA and go through their, go through them to make sure everything is contracted and okay to use. Did that answer your question? We can, oh. we, we can and do take care of VA patients. We do that after approval from the VA. Yeah. So that way we coordinate it so that you, you, don't, you don't lose benefits or lose coverage or lose services because we have we have to do that. We have to make sure that we're taking advantage of the the most effective coverage that you have available. Go ahead, question. If a person is in a nursing home, you can't hear you. I can hear. I'll 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 tell. I'll say that. If a person's in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Who makes the decision to put a patient under hospice? That's going to be a combined decision. Nursing home patient now is being assessed for whether or not they need hospice care. Um, there's a lot of folks that are in a nursing home that would benefit from additional services or just meet criteria for hospice care. Not all of them can afford it for one reason or another, or not all of them want to make that change. Um, honestly, I'm a medical director of a nursing home, have been since I came to town. And I got into hospice because I was, I was uh, actually working with a hospice 
that was identifying folks at end stage to enroll them into, into hospice care while at the nursing home. Um, subsequently, um, you know, obviously I'm in a different situation with a freestanding hospice um, that's not associated with the nursing home. The, the criteria are still the same. A lot of times folks that are in a nursing home are, are at end stage. Um, the, do they need hospice in the nursing home? Maybe. Okay. That being said, it allows for a different set of eyes to be laying eyes on the patient. It allows for the nursing aides to be able to go in and assist the staff aides to do bathing or dressing changes or other things along those lines. Um, it does allow for additional pharmacy review and it takes away some of the other things that are in the nursing home that maybe aren't needed anymore, like the daily weights or the nutritional consultations or uh, somebody put on zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C for their wounds that aren't healing or all the other things that go along with you know, being in a nursing home and all the criteria that they have to meet in order to stay on the right side of the state reviewers. So um, I, I am a proponent, obviously, for hospice care. I see that there's value in certain patients, even in a nursing home. I also understand that there are folks that are in a nursing home that have been that way for five years, and even though they look like they ought to be on hospice, and maybe if they were at home with family, they would have been, but the fact that they're in an environment where most of their daily needs are met, they, they may not need those services. So it, it really is, by the, by the, typically by the time that I get a referral from a nursing home patient, it's usually I'm not gonna have them for very long. They're pretty close to, their, to the end. They've made a significant change in condition. The staff recognizes that, hey, this is somebody that's not gonna do very well and is gonna go down really quickly, and that's typically when we get the referral. Oftentimes, we don't keep them for very long. The other time that we will get folks, folks in the nursing home is if we take them from the hospital and they're discharging, they don't have family support, or they came from a nursing home, they wanna go back where they were, and now we've determined that they meet qualifications for hospice, and patient and family are agreeable with their admission, and they can go back because they've got, got appropriate um, payment for the nursing home, and we take care of those folks at the nursing home. Does that answer your question? It, it would still be the provider at the facility, or we could even do self-referrals as well. Still, what, what was your question, if I wasn't able to sorry. answer that? Who makes the decision to bring hospice in for a person in the nursing home? Now, like our mom, huh? they called us in, had a meeting, had mom in there, yep. and said, uh, we want to put her under hospice. She had a fit, said, oh, no, you know, that's not going to work. And... Uh, Mom didn't need hospice. Heck, she lasted five more years. She only had one. Again, I, I again, one hundred percent agree with you as far as that goes. Um, typically, what that'll happen is the either the nursing staff has noticed a change, or the medical director that's taking care of her at the facility said, you know, look, you know, I'm looking at her. I'm seeing. She meets these criteria. This is what my expectation is, and then you're going to make that recommendation. But again, you have to meet you have to meet requirements, and you have to be in agreement with it. I can't force somebody into it. Well, they kind of told us that that would free them up to get for somebody else to you know like, like the nurses and that do someone else yeah. because we wanted mom to have a shower every day and get dressed every day. Yeah. And so we kind of felt like they didn't want to do all that, but they didn't have to give her a shower every day. They could have gave her a little PTA, you know. No, I absolutely understand. And, and everybody's going to be going to fit that in a different application. And some folks, you know, their care just requires more than the staff can give. And uh, so they're looking for other ways to maybe meet to meet those requirements or maybe to to assist in your goals as well. Yes. Well, you know, there was nothing wrong with Mama's brain, her mind. She was yeah. still at it. And when you present hospice to somebody like that, it gives them no hope. Mm -hmm. No hope. In front of That's that. why when we meet mm -hmm. you know, get out of here. I don't talk to Mama like that. Without a doubt. But that's the reason we need to be able to talk like we are today about it. Because, like I said, everybody thinks hospice morphine death. Well, obviously that wasn't Mom's case. But that being said, 
I've had folks that I, I thought that they were just wonderful. I was going to send them home, take care of them for another two years, you know, have to go visit them a bunch of times, and they don't last the week. You know, I, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes. But the, yeah, the answer to that is the reason that it's such a difficult issue is that so many folks hear the word hospice and they think we're bringing out the backhoe and digging the hole. Well, well if you say they're the patient, they're, they're thinking, oh, I'm ready to check on out of here. But then there's other folks that they're ready to go and family is going to keep them here kicking and screaming forever. <laughs> so it goes both ways. It truly does. <laughs> All right, other questions? Yes. Just from my previous observations, a lot of times patients don't take advantage of hospice care because they associate hospice with immediate or impending death. Mm -hmm. right. yes. But the flip side of that is, if you're able, <laughs> the flip side of that is, if you're able to access hospice care early, a lot of times their life expectancy progresses because they're receiving excellent care right. more so than they would otherwise and they're not experiencing the stress of all the procedures that go along with trying to prevent them from dying. So it, I, I really try to talk to people and say it's not about the end, it's about now and your quality of life now. And your quality of life can get a lot better on hospice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got nothing to add to that. I'm going to go to the lady in blue first and then, and then you My sister had hospice. She was young. She died at 65. But with my experience with hospice, they took very good care of her. They took very good care of her. They took very good care of her. And then she got sent to Indianapolis, to IU. And they came in and they talked to us in the family and said, this is about as much as we can do. They took her from there and put her in a nursing home. I don't know if it's in, it's somewhere around there. And she stayed there for about, mm, about two or three weeks. But she did come home. And I'm not, I think she lived almost a year after that. But see, Helen had cancer. Mm -hmm. And she had, like I said, hospice came to her house. Mm -hmm. They bathed her. And she had this before she even told the family. Mm -hmm. But she, she had it, and they did take care of her. Okay. You know, you know, I had my husband home. <coughs> I had my husband home. And when I first applied for hospice, I mean, Within a couple of weeks, I mean, they told me on the money how much time he had. And, you know, the nurses were there when I was trying to bathe him by myself. And he was a small man, but it's still hard on me. Sure. They came in every day. They bathed him. I mean, they did the medication and showed me how to do it and document it and everything. I mean, they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. And even after he passed, they still uh, sent me uh, brochures or they called. And then asked me, uh, did I want to come to the meetings and different things? I mean, they were wonderful. I mean, the, I mean, the women that came, them nurses that came, they were just great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, I'm, Elizabeth. I'm going to take her, and I'll get you next. Did you have uh, something? Uh, no, but I think one time I took care of my father, and my father was completely bedridden, and they brought people in, and he was crying because he said. There was nothing wrong with him. There was nothing wrong with his brain. And it, bringing people in like that sometimes is more depressing to the sick person than it is to, to anybody else. And my mother and I took turns taking care of him. I was big. I'm pretty big, and I was the one who was responsible for turning him. And I, I got up every night and turned him in, turned him just like a hot dog. <laughs> I, don't to I was the one that turned him. Yeah. And, and I was the one that turned him one yeah. night. And I found out he had died in his sleep. Oh. But uh, it, was, it was my responsibility. And since I had been married, oh, well, I, I just said it was mine because that was something that I could do. Well, that's wonderful that you were there for him. 
I don't think I'm going to get better. Come on. Uh, show. <laughs> my hus husband, um, the doctor presented uh, his going into hospice, and he said immediately, I'm not dealing with the God squad. <laughs> so that, I, thought, I never heard of that term before. <laughs> but anyway, my boys talked him into it, and actually, he was only supposed to have four days to live. And my boys told him that it had been a stress on me, and they were worried about how I was doing, so he agreed to it. And I think he had a little crush on the nurses <laughs> <laughs> that came to bake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he looked forward to it. <laughs> but uh, it was, he did have that negative thing. And it's really difficult, um, Joy, to take care of someone in the home. Because I always discourage people if they didn't have backup. That's 24 hours a day. And I know Esther and I were near the same age. If he hadn't been able to help some with his turning and things, mm -hmm. I don't think I would be able to have done it. Thank you. All right, we're, we're running out of our time, well, so I want to find out. Last one. My sister had the pump. Helen had the pump. Yeah. And all. Yeah. Like I said, she had a lot of stuff before we knew about it. Yeah, and that, that make, it really makes a difference to, to really look at what the person needs and get the right services together with them. That's the advantage of going out to the home and doing that assessment there. All right, Kristen, I'm going to hand this back so you can close things up and get the uh, proper introductions. Yes. I will just add to kind of what you were talking about and what Jane had said that if you come in early enough into hospice <laughs> services, we become part of like your family. We really do. We get to know you. We get to know your family. Um, we get to know the situation. And we hope that, that um, if you were to need to use our services or hospice services at all, that you would feel that, that we become kind of an extension of your family at that point in time. Um, because we do care. We, we want to make sure that you guys have all the resources that you need, and we want to make sure that your loved one is as comfortable as possible during this stage. And we definitely want to th say thank you for allowing us to come in. Yes, thank you. Because we understand this is an intimate time, and we just we really appreciate you allowing us to be a part of that. <laughs> well, then we have the threshold choir over here. Are you guys? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. And I want to thank Sherry. I just walked in the door and said, we're, we're the threshold singers, and we want to do a little demonstration. Is that okay? And she said, sure. So thank you, Sherry. Um, the threshold choir is, uh, we are threshold singers, I should say, of Richmond, Indiana. We're part of a larger organization called the Threshold Choir. Uh, but what we do is come to bedsides of people who are nearing death, the threshold between life and death is where our name comes from. We come by invitation, so you won't find us wandering the halls of the hospital and peeking in and saying, do you want us to come and sing? It doesn't work like that. We come by invitation, we come in small groups, three or four singers, and we sing songs that are um, quiet, and lullaby-like, and um, we feel our songs help provide peace and comfort to the people we sing to, and their family, the patient, the family, and even the caregivers have told us that they are affected by our music. We have sung in the hospital, we have sung at nursing homes, um, not so much lately because of COVID, but we did sing outside for a patient uh, during COVID. So um, we just wanted to share, and I have information, um, if you'd like to take some of that with you, uh, but we just want to share one song with you so you get a feel for what we do. And so thank you for letting us do that. May you dwell in the heart, may you be
Okay. Hey, one last thing before we, we step away, I'd like to introduce our chaplain, uh, David Daniels, a member of our team. He's a huge advocate for, for God, obviously, but uh, for bringing the uh, important parts together as folks near their, their final uh, minutes here on earth and, and advance to the next generation. So we, we very much appreciate his services, those of the other members of the, of the hospice chaplain team, and, and very much appreciate what, what you do and, and everything that, that you represent. Um, I just like to see and hear things from this side because I'm always hearing them from my side. And of course, we uh, just go and give spiritual care to wherever the patient is in their journey. Um, we do try to leave, I try to leave with a sense that uh, the patient has peace with God, they have peace with others uh, in this life and in the next. And uh, Lord willing, the biggest part, uh, I leave having peace in my heart that, that they're doing well with our team and with all that we have to do that God has given us to do. Thank you, David. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to say that there is a place for volunteers who want to come and to sit and just to give a break to the people who are involved in the home situation. I also would like to suggest that in so doing, problems are often solved. Uh, between families mm -hmm. and when those families can get together and relieve themselves of this kind of thing beautiful things happen yes they do and uh, so I uh, it, it's it's a heartfelt kind of thing but it's a kind of a beautiful thing that can happen when you know that you've been there and that people have been able to calm down because mm -hmm. sometimes there are problems within the families and if they can get together, uh, things happen. I had one family that ended up that she was out of hospice. But when I first saw her, she said, I won't be there when you come again. Mm -hmm. But when we each time it became almost like a game. Mm -hmm. And it ended up that she had to leave, leave the home and go to the hospital. Uh, and I don't know all of the details of that. Is there a time limit for uh, staying at home? And especially if you get better, I guess. And that's absolutely right. As far as the time frames, if folks still meet qualifications, that six months is entry requirement, yeah. not, not end requirement. So we can extend as long as folks still meet the requirements. If they are in a nursing home, then it's gonna be a payment issue. And the same criteria stand, they meet criteria and they, and they um, aren't being treated for their care. And if it's in the hospital, I'm not able to keep someone in the hospital indefinitely. So that's why I limit it unless I have to manage acute symptoms. So, all right, well, I want to thank everyone for their attention. We certainly appreciate you having us here. We, uh, I, we are strong advocates, and, and remember, we are among one of the groups uh, that provide hospice care in the community, and every one of them is excellent, and I want to be available if you all need us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.